Thank you for downloading the latest episode of Positively Trek. We could not do this podcast without the support of our Patreon supporters, including Carl Morris, Joyce Marin, and Jim Stoffel. If you'd like to support the podcast, please go to patreon.com slash positively trek. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, shoutouts, associate producer credits, and more. Thank you so much for your support. And with that, let's get on with the show. What's your book about? The existential pain of living with the consciousness of death and how it defines us as human beings. That's not a conversation killer at all. Totally want to talk about the existential pain of living with the consciousness of death. Hi, everyone. It's Bruce Gibson. I'm here on Positively Trek once again, and I'm doing it without Dan Gunther. I think that he's looking for the lost tribe of the Sith. I don't know. I don't know where he is right now. So let's go ahead and do our book club today because we've got a real doozy here. It's Star Trek Picard Rogue Elements by John Jackson Miller. And no, it's not going to be me just telling you what I think about the book, because that would be boring if I was just talking about it. So with me is John Jackson Miller. Are you looking for the Lost Tribe of the Sith, too? Uh, no, I, uh, I I know where they are. I, we had a map. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. We put it, we put it in the book. Uh, yeah. I love that book, by the way. So anyway, let's move on. We're not here to talk about Star Wars, right? It always ends up that way, but there we go. <laughs> So I want to talk about this book, Rogue Elements. I was really looking forward to this book, especially when I saw the cover with Rios on it. I was like, oh, this is this is going to be good. So I'm just curious, how did you get to do a book about Rios? How did that come about? Uh, well, it was uh, very simply a matter of Margaret Clark, my editor, calling me and saying, uh, you want to do a Picard book? And I said, um, you know, only you know, if it, I could do Rios and uh, she says, well, you're in luck. That's who we want you to do uh, because Rios was my favorite character from the show. And, um, you know, I, it, it, there are, there are projects where you, you know, hear about them and you go, okay, this is going to be challenging or difficult because I've got to go read up on this or that, or this or that, or this or that. Uh, whereas, you know, everything that was Rios was encapsulated in a handful of scenes and really everything you need to know about him is right there in the very first time we meet him, uh, you know, there with his doppelganger doctor and the hunk of metal sticking out of his shoulder and, uh, and you know, the ship that, uh, you know, is delivering him a drink whenever he wants it. Uh, you know, that is, uh, that is, uh, that was kind of enough for me. Uh, and then, you know, as I mentioned, the acknowledgements, I, when I talked to Kirsten uh, Beyer, uh, who's the co-creator of the show, uh, I said, uh, you know, the, the one thing I want to do is just make sure that this is um, a book that is light, that is, uh, you know, fun summer reading, uh, as opposed to, you know, the, the last really five books I did, uh, because, you know, I've been saying Enterprise War and Die Standing, but you throw in the Prey trilogy, too, uh, and, you know, you're dealing with, uh, you know, particularly the Prey Trilogy, there's, there's bodies everywhere in that book. I mean, it is, it, it is, um, you know, there there is a, a pretty high casualty list in that. Um, but, uh, and and even though Enterprise War, you know, you know uh, Pike doesn't lose anybody uh, off of Enterprise, uh, the other factions that are involved in the war, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a bloodbath for them or whatever whatever uh, you know, precious vital fluids they have uh, as they're all aliens. Uh, and then certainly uh, the, uh, the, the die standing book, which was Emperor Giorgio, um, you know, we, we wade into a middle of a war uh, in that book as well, uh, where, you know, there's just a whole lot of uh, violence in it. And I'm like, well, I could go for a certain amount of violence for this thing, but it, it uh, you know, it's, it's a, uh, it's going to be that fun kind of, uh, you know, nobody really gets hurt violence that you would see on TV in the 1960s uh, on, well, like on Star Trek, uh, you know, where, where occasionally people get roughed up. Uh, but, uh, but you know, they're, they'll, they'll say something funny and then go on. 
it's interesting you mentioned that because when I think of Star Trek Picard, I always think about it having such a different tone from T and G. And to your point, when you're relating those other series and the Prey trilogy you did and the other two Discovery books, they were so much like a bloodbath and sort of violent. But this took yeah. a lighter tone compared to the Picard series. And so it was kind of a nice balance to get a lighter tone that's connected to Picard than what I would typically think that we would get in a Rios book. Well, I mean, in a sense, I'm playing against type on on both parts of it because you know, uh, you know TNG, uh, you know, original Trek, you know, are are both uh, you know hopeful at the very least, uh, and uh, you know, you've had I I had these you know fairly complex situations that I you know threw these people into in those previous books, uh, you know, with some with some dark shadows here and there. Uh, and, but, um, you know, I mean, really, uh, what, what is, what is prey except Star Trek, uh, Star Trek six being, you know, uh, done in the next generation, uh, you know, a, a, a crisis of that magnitude, um, you know, with Picard though, coming in, we already are in a darker place, uh, for, you know, both the Federation and what it means to people and the promise of the Federation, uh, it has walked away from its responsibilities. Uh, we have again the, the the people in the outer fringe. You know, it it uh, there's to a small degree. You know, to go back to Star Wars real quick, I did a series called Night Errant, uh, which uh, was set in a time frame where the Jedi and the Republic had basically turned their back on the outer rim uh, and said, you know, there's all these Sith, Sith battling with each other. We're not even going to try to get involved in any of this. Uh, and, you know, we have our, our character, uh, you know, the knight errant, uh, Kara Holt, uh, who is willing to go out there and fight and travel and and do what she can. Uh, here, you know, it's not like there's a war going on. What's happened is that the Romulan Star Empire has collapsed as a result of the destruction of the uh, of the star. Uh, and that, uh, you know, the uh, the things that led up to the series, the, you know, the Federation um, starting to try to... Um, evacuate people only to have it all uh fall apart uh you know after what happens on mars uh and you know una mccormick's book uh last best hope gives us some further uh background which you know suggests that yeah it wasn't just that it was uh, a lot of those you know who who are the newest members of the federation the ones on the frontier uh you know who is the most nervous about refugees coming in the people on the frontier uh, so, you know, you've got people that are not fully, uh, you, know, you know, not fully themselves, uh, uh, you know, part of the, the whole Federation, uh, you know, experiment from the beginning. Uh, you know, these are not founding members that uh, turned away, uh, you know, these people coming across the borders. These, these were uh, the most recent, um, you know, planets uh, to join up. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, the, these, these planets all turn their backs in one way or another, um, on, on the refugees. And so we have here, uh, you know, actually three, uh, organizations, which, uh, are, you know, helping to address what's going on that are non-governmental. Um, and each one is, uh, of a different of a different level of uh, uh, you know benevolence, uh, you know we have we have the, uh, the interspecies medical exchange, which we never say a bad thing about. We never hear a bad thing about them. They're kind of the the, the Red Cross. Uh, we have the Silvus Project, which uh, you know uh, as we find as we get further into the book, there's a bit more nuance to them and their activities. Uh, you know, once we get to the spoilers part, we can we can get into that. And then uh, then there's our main villain and the operation that he runs, uh, which, again, is something that he positions as a benevolent service uh, helping refugees. Uh, and of course, it turns out that there's other other things going on. And, uh, <laughs> you, know, you know, that is uh, that is, again, a case where. Rios, who is cynical about everybody and everything, uh, you know, gets to be exposed to these different things. And, you know, some things don't surprise him and some things do. 
you know, there's different things about this book that kind of reminded me of some other things. And I'm just going to throw these out here to see if any of them influenced you in the writing of this. So there were times I kept thinking of the movie Knives Out yeah. because it kind of had that, like there's a mystery going on and all these different characters and it had that kind of feel to it to me. Um, well, I mean, there was that. I had not seen the movie when I wrote the book. I saw it after I wrote the book. Okay. Um, although if I want to really go back, I mean, uh, you know, the trick, the trick knife, uh, uh, the, the knife with the retracting blade uh, is actually a major plot point in uh, in uh, in uh, the Prey trilogy, uh, although it's not a knife, it's a duck tog. Uh, you know, that's uh, that's that's how uh, that's how our, our illusionist uh, uh, you know, meets an imaginary end at one point with one of those. Yeah, uh, it, no, it's not something that I was uh, was shooting for, obviously, because I hadn't seen it. Um, but uh, but no, I I wanted I did want to have this centerpiece uh, of this uh, of this thing, uh, this piece that you know where you've got uh, everybody showing up for dinner, uh, where you have a you know sort of a convention of everybody taking place on this ship, which again when we see it in the TV show looks enormous inside. I mean, there's like all this blank space or empty space. Uh, you could be doing something in here. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it, it happened that again, when I'm conceiving of this, I've already missed, you know, the entire 2020 convention season. Cause that's all over by that point. Uh, and uh, because of the pandemic and I was just sort of saying, okay, well, let's, let's go ahead and have a convention, except we'll just have it on the Las Arena. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. That'd be a convention I want to go to. Yeah, a convention or a conference or a well, you, well, we see what it is, and uh, you know, and, and there's a, there's an auction that's the centerpiece, uh, and it makes use of the whole space, and I mean the whole space. Well, that's uh, we interesting. Used, yeah, because yeah. I th I really felt like I got to know the ship better from reading the book because we're going in all these different spaces, and you're describing what for on yeah. the one floor versus the other, and so you had schematics of the ship. Well, I got it from uh, there was a video that was done, I think, for the um, it, well, I found it on YouTube, but it was also I think it was also done for the uh, for the Blu-ray, uh, where the uh, designer of the sets. Uh, you know, showed us a couple of snapshots of of the uh, you know the two decks that uh, that I got to know best, uh, and I screen capped those and uh, you know brought them into uh, Photoshop, changed the sizes so that they matched because uh, the scales weren't the same. Figured out what some of the you know deciphered some of the things that were actually in very very tiny print on the thing, uh, and uh, and then asked questions where I needed to because. Yeah, I still had I still had questions uh, about what was where, and then in the middle of all of this, or near actually not the middle, but near the end of all this, uh, you know, Eagle Moss puts out his, its uh, its little book that comes with the La Serena models, uh, and they had sent me that book beforehand, and you know I did look at that quite a lot of what is mentioned in that book uh, is not uh, representative of the actual ship. Uh, a lot of that actually has to do with uh, you know, stuff they were discussing in the beginning. And so such things in it, like mentioning, you know, they mentioned photon torpedoes. Uh, you know, I decided I don't want this thing to have photon torpedoes. This is a freighter. What's a freighter going to do with photon torpedoes? Right. Exactly. You're talking about something which is a co op. Do they just let anybody have a photon torpedo? Uh, that, that sh that's a very, very bad idea if, the, if that's the case. Um, but, you know, I was able to do things like, uh, you know, it is not obvious from the show that, you know, the the, the back of the ship uh, has uh, towing locks uh, that can actually, you know, link on to another ship uh, like a tugboat. Uh, and so that caused me to go back into the plot or go back into the manuscript. And, you know, right at the very beginning, we mentioned uh, we mentioned the towing couplers and we mentioned that they don't work. Uh, so, because I didn't want to deal with them, right. <laughs> you just write yourself out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, that's but but again, you know, even though I don't think anybody ever pretended that I was aware of that, you know, what's in those little model books uh, is canonical in any way. Uh, I don't need the trouble. Uh, <laughs> just <laughs> right. if I can fix it, I can fix it. I mean, I'm 
when, you know, when I wrote the Prey trilogy, I was sitting there with the uh, the the bird of prey uh, operators manual from Haynes, the Haynes bird of prey operators manual, and I was really heavy duty. You know, where's the bathroom? Where's the weapons locker? Where's the everything? Uh, and uh, yeah, there just wasn't that for this, so I, I had to kind of make it up on my own. Yeah. So this is what then I wanted to know is why did you go to the Ioceans? Um, I hit them right in the beginning. Uh, I knew they, I knew I wanted them right there at the start. Um, is that because Rios, you thought Ioceans and Rios would make a good coupling? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I needed mobsters. So, you know, who am I going to get? I mean, nobody, you know, what, what am I going to, uh, what are we going to do a Ryan's for the 93rd time? Um, you know, <laughs> right. I, I I was like, you know, I'm not going to do that. Uh, let me let me actually do something that allows me to then lock into all sorts of other themes, such as um, you know, uh, uh, you know, nature versus nurture, blah 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 blah. You know, uh, you know the importance of books. I knew was going to be a big deal because one of the things that we were going to establish was how he went from being somebody who did not read philosophy to somebody who did and somebody who doesn't read it on a pad. He reads it on the physical books. Uh, and I was like, okay, well, that's good. Let's uh, here. We have a, a, an entire culture that is, you know, changed its world because of a specific book that showed up and uh, you know, how, how, how might they have evolved? Um, you know, what, uh, what, was in that book anyway, because, you know, I think there's some serious questions as to, uh, well, first of all, the appearance of the book, which they do say it was published in 1992, and it does not look like anything we would have put out in 1992. No, it doesn't. No, what it looks like, you could almost say what it looks like is one of those books that you see at half price at the front of Barnes and Noble, where I was just thinking that, yes. Yeah, like it, where it's an oversized thing where they've tried to make it look old timey and but it, and inside it's lavishly, you know, whatever illustrated with lots of lots of stuff in it. Uh, but, you know, it also struck me that, you know, most of the stuff that, you know, would be in a real book about mobsters in the 20s and particularly um you know in the 30s once we once we get out of prohibition um you know you've got a um you got quite a lot of really bad stuff that just does not appear on screen um you know in the in the episode i mean you you had all of the episodes of the untouchables that desi lu did uh and yeah, you know, I have not watched it start to finish, uh, but you know, there's not a lot of opium fiend episodes. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, you know, there's not a lot of uh, episodes that that dig too far into the seamier side of of human trafficking and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, they it's it's all um, yeah, it's all uh, uh, you know uh, 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 bootleg alcohol and uh, running the numbers racket and and stuff like that uh and you know even though we we even see streetwalkers on the street uh when we arrive on uh sigma iosha 2 you know you don't get any sense that they, they're there to do anything more than um uh, uh you know pose on the street uh because they must have seen photos of, of people like that on the street uh, in, uh, in in that in that line people in that line of work, but they might not have found out what the work was in the book uh, because and and I, and so we delve into that we delve specifically into why these things are not you know part of the Iocean society. Uh, the Iocean's are more or less cosplaying uh, uh, you know uh, the Untouchables. Uh, but, you know, just like, um, you know, I, and I make this point in the book, uh, you know, just like your, your military reenactors are not burying a lot of bodies or digging a lot of latrines, uh, just like your, you know, Renaissance fair people are not, you know, uh, having to cope with a lot of uh, cases of the Black Death. Uh, you don't have 
uh, a lot of these things in the Iotians view or, or you know, their, their, their world is, it's much more of a, it's much more of a video game. Well, I like the character of Ledger, and I also like how you focus more on the women. Like you were saying, when we saw a piece of the action, they are more or less background material here. But that's exactly yeah, you do, they're set dressing. Uh, you know, right. Only the only the women on the uh, on the street, I think, have lines. Uh, and uh, you know, there's but there is a different there's a, there's there's a different girl on each uh, 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 a different woman on each uh, of the mobster bosses' desks. Uh, and so it's, it's like, and they're, and they're all holding machine guns. So it's, you know, they're, 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 so again, uh, you know, I'm like, okay, this is, this is something I can do something with. And so we'll take boss ox mix and we'll take, um, you know, the, the, the woman that was at his office. Um, and, and, uh, you know, she will, uh, she'll be in our book. Um, and we'll also explain why, uh, they misspelled the sign outside boss, uh, boss ox Mix's house. I like that. Yeah, that was good, too. I caught that. There was little things in there like that I was catching because I know, you know, I know I'm a Star Trek fan if I catch little things like that. I was having to deal with it because I was like, what's what's because I, I rewatched the episode a couple of times. So I was like, wait, a right. that, that ain't right. Uh, what did you put in there? <laughs> and then I then I, you know, went everywhere I went, said, yeah, it's just a misspelling. It's like, OK, so yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll we'll explain it. Well, and then Arco, why you know, too many K's. Yeah, Arco, you know, right? that's, well, and Arco you know. even shows up on the desk when transported onto the La Serena. Yeah, that's that's her thing, and uh, and <laughs> but but you know, her desk is uh, her desk becomes her throne uh, that she's carried around on, and uh, yeah. So no, Ledger, I I Ledger is one of my favorite characters I've created in years. Um, you know, it's uh, it's you know, some of the characters that have been in uh, other. Uh, other books of mine that have been a lot of fun to work with uh, were either partially inspired by the TV show or we had something from them. Um, you know, the, 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 the kid in, uh, in Enterprise War that's obsessed with baseball, uh, you know, that's all mine. But, you know, Connolly, he was he was uh, he was he was somebody who dies in the first five minutes of that we see him in, in, uh, in Discovery. Uh, but I, so I felt like I could do what I wanted to with him. Uh, and uh, and then you know Finnegan and Esri Dax in uh, in Die Standing, again I was more or less allowed to make them up out of out of uh, you know, whole cloth beyond what we had seen and what we had seen is just a little bit of what Esri was like uh, you know from uh, from the you know sort of the seance episode of uh, of uh, DS Nine and then you know we we got to see Nightmare Finnegan uh in uh in uh shore leave and so i'm kind of like well i i i i didn't i didn't get to create too many original characters in some of these things but although i got to you know i i had mostly blank slates to work with on a couple of characters um uh, this was one where um you know i uh i really i i write a a, a i write a good uh uh you know capitalist exploiter of the of the uh, of the masses uh, and uh, and you know whether it's Griff from Knights of the Old Republic or uh, Jamie Sturm from my uh, from my uh, Overdraft uh, book years ago, uh, you know uh, anybody who is is uh, pretty good with a calculator uh, is is going to be fun to write for me. When you're writing books for Star Trek like this or any tie in fiction, do you feel that it's necessary that you bring in elements from other episodes of Star Trek as opposed to just creating everything new just around the character? Uh, it just happens. Um, but I will say that, and, and in particular, you know, I never start from the position of I want to tie this together with this, with this, with this. Most of the sub references that came out of um, uh, you know, rogue elements, uh, you know, were not purposeful, uh, or, or rather they show up later. Um, Dixon Hill was not something I initially planned to put in this book, but it was a direction I wanted to be, you know, I, I was free to go in if I wanted to. Uh, but I realized, okay, this is part of this book. This makes sense. This is, this is a thing. You know, I knew who our villain was going to be. I knew, yeah, I, at, at a minimum, I, I had an episode of Next Gen and an episode of the original series that I was going to riff on. Um, and, you know, then I expand outward from that. Um, but also, you know, there is there is a, a dynamic, which is 
when I started working for Star Wars, uh, you know, they very rarely would tell you to do something or not to do something. But one of the things that happened early on is Leland Chi, who was running the the Holocron, the, the keeper of the Holocron, the, the, the big database, he at one point said, OK, please, people, stop creating new planets. Uh, we have because <laughs> he had to keep up with all of them. Well, no, there were over 3000 at that point. And he, and he said, yeah, if you if you look, if you Google, um, there actually was a physical copy of the Holocron that that, you know, you could get and you could look at it yourself at that point as a writer. I never was able to get mine to boot up, uh, but it didn't matter because yeah, they were always faster uh, on on online uh, uh, Wikipedia, memory alpha, these things, they they would they catch things as they happen pretty much. Uh, so I, I was looking, what, what will happen is I will find something that is in the neighborhood, uh, that fits, uh, and usually that will give me something else I can work with. Um, you know, when I, uh, came up with the idea of, uh, you know, uh, the, the, I wanted Ledger and Rios's first place they went to. Uh, to be a cold and snowy planet, uh, and because I had just riffed on the Soviet gulags, I had just riffed on Siberia, and I needed some place to put it. But I knew where I was. I was near the Romulan Star Empire. Uh, I was near the I was near the the former uh, the former neutral zone, and so I said, okay, Alpha Carinae, that system that's in that neighborhood. We know that Alpha Alpha Carinae five is the home of the Drella, which is the, uh, the, the, uh, it's, it's mentioned by Spock at one point as, uh, a, a, uh, a gaseous being that absorbs love that absorbs an emotion. Uh, and I'm like, okay, well, what I'll do is I'll have Rios there on that planet for his first really dumb job. Uh, it will be, you know, he's, he's had to take this lovesick alpha Carinian, uh, you know, teenager to visit the Drella in system uh, so that it will soak up all of his teenage angst so he can go <laughs> back home. And again, that gives us a sub-reference to whatever that episode of, of Trek was. I'm not even sure which one it was, uh, but, you know, it, it was there. I didn't have to invent any place new. Um, you know, I uh, usually if I'm going to invent someplace new, it's because I'm going to wreck it. Uh, it's it's because I'm gonna do something to it that's gonna be, you know, bad enough that uh, well either either I'm gonna do something drastic to it that will make it unusable for somebody else, or uh, you know I I just will not want to cope with the history of something. <laughs> See, now uh, I know if I read a book of yours and you introduce a new planet, I'm like, oh, gosh, he's going to wreck it. Well, it's not all the time. It's not all the time. <laughs> sometimes I just sometimes I just like creating something that I can come back to. You know, it, it, you know I, I, I hate to say that there's you know, a Miller verse that's existing in between the uh, in, 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 you know, in, in the Star, Star Wars, Star Trek uh, you know, books that I'm doing or not between rather. Although there is one element that is in. In you, you, that that is in my Star Wars stuff that pops up in uh, in in this particular novel, um, we'll see if anybody can figure it out. Uh, but but no, there there, I do have running things. Uh, the biggest running thing that I've got in all of my novels uh, is the Thyanoga Detention Center, uh, which is a a a yes. an, which is basically it's a a prison that is attached to an asteroid. That is, uh, it was originally a joint investment between the Federation and various outside powers. Uh, this was inspired by, you know, we have all these, you know, novel approaches to, you know, you know prisons that we find out about in the original series. Uh, and I basically, I needed a hellhole to put people. Uh, and, uh, you know, a, a, so it's, it's there in prey, but we don't visit it. Uh, I don't think it really gets mentioned in Enterprise War, uh, but oh boy, it's, I mean, we 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 actually get to visit in person, uh, both in um, uh, both in uh, uh, die standing, die standing. We we really use it, yeah. uh, and uh, and then rogue elements, and so uh, it, it comes up again. Yeah, because I was like when I when that appeared, I was like, wait, I've heard of this before. I know this is oh, yeah. somewhere. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, and and so you know, it, it's not my intention to create something that that you know other people will use or that they'll pick up for a TV show or something one day. Uh, but if they wanted to, that'd be fine by me. Uh, it just it it's it's a it's a device where I didn't want to have to go digging for someplace new uh, when I was writing that because I or, or rather I didn't I didn't want to have to dig for someplace that existed when I was writing that because. Uh, in particular, during prey, uh, a lot of things were dependent on geography. Um, you know, everything. I had the maps out. I everything has got to be in the beta quadrant, and it's got to be in this. You know, in the in the in this area that is in between the Klingon Empire and the Romulans and the other Typhon Pack powers, or wherever we imagine it would be. So I got a very small neighborhood to put stuff in. And I'm kind of like, you know, I'm I'm just not gonna uh, I'm not gonna bang my head against the wall trying to find some place that already exists uh, just to please, uh, you know, a a a directive that I got for another TV show or another another, another movie rather uh, for a completely other license. Uh, so uh, so yeah um, yeah that's the long answer to that question. <laughs> Well, I want to start getting into spoilers here in a moment, but before we do, yeah. because anybody who hasn't read the book that doesn't want to get hear the spoilers yet, that's trying to decide if they want to read this at this point, I would think they do want to read it because you've said some really great stuff. But I've also remember you mentioning at Shore Leave, I did the virtual Shore Leave. I think you said something like, this is the most fun you've had with a Star Trek book or, the, yeah. or oh, you really oh, enjoyed it. It's like your Oh, longest. absolutely. Absolutely. I didn't want to let go of it. I mean, it was, I... One of the things that I did um, was I actually changed where I write the book. Um, I uh, was so desperate for any change of scenery that I set up an old computer of mine. Um, and I, basically, I was just doing flash drive sneakerware back and forth between me and the den, uh, the living room. Uh, and you know, I would, I would sit out there, um, you know, in, in the big bay window with the TV on set to um, a streaming channel uh, on YouTube that would be streaming uh, downtown in some interesting place. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, live streaming at a, a uh, you know, sometimes sometimes I would put something on for the for, you know, a, a live stream of a park so my, my cat could attack the TV set uh, and attack the birds. <laughs> Uh, but but no, I mean, I, I most of the time I would be tuned into, um, you know, someplace that I would like to be, uh, uh, you know, and have it's it right like out It's like your own holodeck, window. right? Yeah, that's exactly it. And, uh, you know, the weird thing is that what fit most, because again, where I live in Wisconsin, it was snow outside. Uh, I ended up, you know, live streaming most of the time, even further north, uh, you know, images from uh, from Canmore, Alberta in Canada. Uh, up in the Rockies, and it was just sort of like, well, now I look like I've taken a hotel room and in, in one of these resort towns up north. Uh, so, because uh, because you know, when I, whenever I whenever I tried to put on you know Maui or something like that, it, uh, it, it wasn't selling it for me. Well, I okay. So let's go into the spoiler territory. You know, there's a there's so much in this book that we could cover, and I know we're not going to get to it all. But this actuality thing. Yeah. The the this this apple that I guess is the MacGuffin of the yeah. story. So tell us about that and how that whole operates and and how you worked in Gorkin, where where that came from, and Star Trek VI, the undiscovered country. I knew that we needed, um, you know, it it, it, I, it it came in very very early. I I wanted to have something that people would want that was on La Serena such that Rios, who goes about 40% of the book without knowing, you know, why people care about the ship, why people care about him. Um, you know, I, you know, anybody who thinks this, this book starts slow, I don't know that it really starts slow, but they wonder where it's going. Well, it's not going anywhere. It's going where he's going. It's following him. He's aimless. He's drifting um, very much. Uh, you know, I've, I've made this I've made this comparison online uh, with, you know, we had Kanan uh, Jairus from Rebels 
uh, in the New Dawn book, where for the first third of the book, he's just drinking. I mean, he's just flying around and 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 trying to avoid trouble. Uh, and uh, then, you know, he, he's thrown into a situation. Well, this isn't even that kind of a case where he's thrown into a situation. Um, the situation is already there. It's already ongoing. He is in the middle of the story as soon as he sets foot on the ship. He just doesn't know it yet. He doesn't know what the story is. We find out that there is this whole backstory to, you know, the previous owner and how he spent the last couple of years uh, on the ship relating to this object. Um, and, you know, I wanted to be very careful with, with, uh, with that as well, because again, you know, to go back to Dixon Hill and to go back to, uh, you know, noir, uh, noir novels and noir movies, uh, you know, the idea of the MacGuffin, the idea of the, the black bird, the, uh, the Maltese Falcon, um, you know, when you're making such a big deal out of it, it can be a really big letdown once, once you get to it. Uh, whatever the thing happens to be, whatever the object has to happens to be. And so what I tried to do was underplay as often as possible um, that it was the that it was the the apple. You you kind of maybe are getting that idea, but Rios tries to give it away twice. Yeah. And he even puts it away a couple of times. Like it kind of makes appearances and goes away throughout. Yeah, he 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 offers to sell it to Fajo. Uh, Fajo, I've been calling him Fajo, but it's Fajo apparently, uh, according to the audiobook and the TV show. Uh, he, he offers to sell it. He offers to give it to the kid Yerm. Uh, just he doesn't care, and and he's not getting anywhere with it. And he doesn't get anywhere with it until he just really, you know, is like, okay, well, I've got nothing better to do. Uh, and, and then it becomes a little bit of a minor obsession and, uh, and, and then he begins to realize, oh, good Lord, this is why, uh, this thing is what people care about. But even when he opens it and turns it on, he still doesn't know why. Uh, he only knows that the Ferengi and Varengan opened it and he knows that it caused Varengan and again audiobook they use the, uh, the, the, the which is a wonderful audiobook but uh, Robert Petkoff uses the actual Klingon pronunciation Varengan uh, uh, or something like that. Oh yeah, which stands for Ferengi. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he he, you know the the Klingon former owner realizes, oh my gosh, yeah, I know what this thing is now, and no, 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 no. I, I we're lucky he doesn't beam it into a star. Uh, because, you know, he, he knows it's a thing he got from his father, uh, who got it from Chang. And, uh, but at that point he knew he had gotten it from his father, but he didn't know he got it from Chang. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we may assume he was discommendated. We, we may assume he's, uh, he's been aimless and adrift. Uh, I tried not to land too hard on the discommendation part. Uh, too early because I had done prey and prey was just full of that topic. Uh, but uh, as, as, you know, as you get Varangon and Chang, well, I'm like at that point, you know, let's go ahead and give him a community. Let's go ahead and give him his own holographic um, uh, cast of characters that are not the EMHs, but are the emergency holograms, uh, but are a program on the holodeck. And that allowed me to then tap into this completely separate thread of, um, well, what did the holodeck characters know anyway? Uh, and that comes from the show uh, because we have in there a uh, scene where Rafi is questioning uh, the, the five uh, about Rios in his past. And they'll look at each other and their eyes will flash. And again, we realize they're not really talking to each other behind the digital scenes very much. Uh, and they may not even be allowed to, and that's why I get into the Moriarty protocols and uh, and the other the other things that prevent that uh, from happening. And again, we also get into it. Um, you know, I, I I'm able to allude to it with uh, with the car uh, where Rios is trying to fix it, and he's talking about how you know um, um, you know one of the one of the one of the unique things that uh, that Tucker did uh, with the car was he networked the steering wheel with the headlights 
Um, and that was the first time anybody had done that. And it turned out not to be a sensible thing. Everybody hated it, um, but it, or not hated it, but it, again, it, it, it didn't go any further beyond it. And he also had the center, central headlight, which was kind of weird. <laughs> but uh, but but I'm I, I, I'm I'm reading up about that, and I'm going like, well, that just sounds exactly like the holograms and the holodeck. And you know, the the only way you're going to find out the answers about uh, this former owner is by actually interviewing everybody else on the ship. Uh, and it gave it kind of a a mystery feel to it that that wasn't there before. And then you know, just naturally. On top of that, you've got Rios's particular um, sadness, his particular, you know, predicament that has put him on this ship that has has kicked him out of Starfleet, uh, and he's able to bring his troubles to the Klingons of the holodeck the same way that uh, the former owner did. Don't you feel like he's trying to, in some ways, find his place or redeem himself on, on these adventures that he's trying to do? I don't think he's I, I, I don't think he's even that far. He's shell shocked. He is, and that phrase is used. I think he I think he had everything pulled out from under him. Uh every, you know, if if we believe what he says about um you know Vandermeer, the the captain, and what that guy meant to him and to have him do the mysterious thing he did, and then to have all of the blame land on him, uh, basically, you know, I asked, I asked, how how does this work? And I was told, yeah, he he takes the fall for everything. Um, uh, he he every he they they have to mothball or something the ship. I, well, I didn't get into that, but the presumption is that the ship is either gone or mothballed or something or destroyed. Uh, and nobody is ever allowed to speak of the ship again. We have kind of a wink to uh, to Discovery season two there. Uh, what make a Starfleet vessel disappear from the records? There's no chance of that ever working. Never. Um, <laughs> no, but that's okay because I kind of I kind of uh, am subversive like that. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, the die standing has some subversive notes about the way that they resolve the Klingon War. So. Um, so yeah, that, that I'm, I, I, I work my little bits of uh, mischief without causing too much trouble. Um, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, um, yeah, he's trying to, uh, you sort of pick up the pieces, uh, but yeah, he's got nowhere to go. Uh, we don't know what his past was cause I wasn't given that. Uh, we don't know what his family situation was. We can just presume that he's alienated from everybody or nobody exists. Uh, and, you know, we've got a guy that still 10 years later, nine years later, eight years later, however long it is, is a loader, is a hermit, is, you know, is got these 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 holograms. So, you know, he uh, he he gets better. Um you know, he he's he's he has stretches where he's more sober than he's not and where he's more functional than he's not. And, you know, that's when he's trying to, uh, you know, to to piece his life together and uh, and do the great deed as as uh, as as uh, Kalos advises him to do something that, you know, would have been reminiscent of his original heroic self. Um, but you know, we can't see this situation as, as lasting very long. I, I got a very, very nice, uh, you know, note, uh, I, I, I've gotten a number of, uh, notes over the years from, you know, people who are in similar situations with, with characters, uh, whether it has to do with, uh, loss or addiction or, um, you know, whatever, uh, you know, my protagonists are going through. Uh, and I'm always trying to deal with these things as honestly as I can, such that there are no easy solutions and that, um, you know, in, in Rios's case, um, he can't get resolution for everything in this book because we don't see that person uh, in the TV show. We see that he's still fairly damaged the TV show. But again, it also happens to be the case that, you know, it's 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 going to be a process for anybody who's dealing 
uh, with with that kind of a trauma uh, that uh, that you know they're going to be good years and bad years and good days and bad days. When you said about Rios picking up the pieces, it it really hit me because it feels like a lot of these characters are picking up pieces. I mean, Ledger is in a place where she almost has to redeem herself to her bosses. And then we have Fijo who was in prison and kind of put his life together. And then I'm leading now towards to Parch. Yeah. Because that's a whole nother thing there. Tell us about Parch. Yeah. That whole concept is so interesting and fascinating to me. Um, I wanted there to be this figure behind the scenes who is mysterious, the creator. You know, there there's this whole legend behind the Maltese Falcon. And, you know, hearing about that is is interesting to us in the theater, but maybe not quite so interesting to uh, Sam Spade, uh, who is just not really caring about uh, the, the, the details. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I wanted there to be this figure who was a player back in the past, a player that we just did not ever see. Uh, And I had to look for a sensible place to fit this person in. You know, I don't even say for absolute certain, Parch does not know for absolute certain that, you know, Parch was the person that created the meetup in the beginning or, 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 you know, brokered the 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 deal between the uh, the Kenner, uh conspirators. Uh, you know, Parches is, is sort of like, well, I don't know if the, I don't know if that was all me or not. Um, but either way, I take it as me. Uh, I, I take it on myself, and you know, goodbye. Uh, I'm not going to do this anymore. And you know, this is a character who, uh, you know, I knew it was going to be pretty difficult to have somebody that would be an overwhelming personage that's going to be just at the back of the book. Um, and I, I, I wanted parts to be tired and resigned and, um, you know, ready for it to maybe be over. Um, but has outlived, uh, you know, outlived any expectation that, you know, death would just, you know, end this quickly. Uh, it is said about Duke Javen that um, you know how long do uh, uh, how how long do uh, Valtese live? Uh, not as long as he has. Uh, <laughs> and what is the Valtese lifespan? Not you know, he's past it. Uh, and I knew that this would have to be the case of uh, you know for Parch as well. And and so um, you know I I wanted there to be. Um, you know, this, this thing where, you know, the character wouldn't have come out of the middle of nowhere. And that gets us to our Marquesa that gets us to, um, you know, the, the Silvis project, which, as I said, sort of straddles that line between being wholly benevolent and good and useful. And, you know, they could actually be, you know, creating trouble at the same time. Uh, they do create trouble. They just create trouble for Rios and Rios decides at the end, you know what? Fine. I'll take it on myself. Uh, we're not going to destroy a bunch more lives. Uh, we're not going to, we're not going to, you know, I've, I've already got one cover up. What's one more. Well, you know, Rios past really haunts him. Like you mentioned earlier, but what does Rios learn by the time we get to the end of this book and dealing with parts and, and, all the situations, all the people he's dealt with. I think that he has, he has found that there are places that he can go looking for answers. He may not find them there, but, you know, I, I decided on purpose that in the beginning, cause I had to create, you know, I know where he is in 19, uh, 1999, 2399. I knew where he was there. I did not know exactly what kind of person he was like uh, in 2391. And so I decided, okay, well, the way that I can create this growth uh, in part is to show a different kind of character there at the beginning. The same thing happened with Lost Tribe of the Sith, where I knew the end state uh, and I could start back from, from what it was before. And so, uh, you know, we established at the beginning, he doesn't read books. He, he might read, you know, he might read an, an operator's manual. He might read a, a, a technical manual. He just is not somebody who has an internal life uh, that uh, that comes from literature or comes from, from philosophy. 
Uh, and um, so, uh, so we, we hit him with that and, and, you know, it, it, whether he finds it enriching or not, he certainly finds it fills time and he has nothing but time. Uh, he has nothing but time until he gets his answers. And, um, you know, he has, I think by 2399, he has no expectation that he's going to get his answers. I think by the end of Rogue Elements, he thinks that maybe he's got a shot. Um, but he is mature enough to tell, um, you know, and my, my favorite scene of the book is when, uh, you know, after, after Ledger has been rescued, uh, and she says, well, now let's go get the treasure. And he's like, you're all about the treasure. And she says, yeah, I have to be, because if, if, if you didn't rescue me because of the treasure, you rescued me because you rescued me. And you're not ready to deal with a normal adult human relationship that lasts more than 24 hours. And, right. and are you? And he says, yeah, you're kind of right. And so he's still got something to fix at the end of this book, but he may be, you know, feeling more like it's doable. Um, I don't know that after a second book that took two years long, he would feel the same way in 2395 or in 2397 because he sure doesn't feel that way in 2399. I will tell you, I would love to see a follow-up book to this. I'm assuming you would like to write one. Um, You know, rarely do I ever, well, first of all, I always treat every book like it's the last. Um, And that includes comics. That includes anything because you just never know. Uh, And, you know, unless it's like a three-part series or something like that, you know, you, you don't, uh, you know, you don't expect that that uh, you know there there will automatically be the next book. Um, I can tell you uh, when I got to the end of the Kenobi novel, all along I'd been saying I'd said everything I had to say about Kenobi, and then I got to the end of it and I realized, oh well, I I just realized how I could do two more books, uh, and I, oh, I'm all for that, and yeah. everybody everybody is all for that, but I don't know that Luke. <laughs> I don't know that Lucasfilm is for that. Um, you know, it's, it's not a new thing. This has been, you know, I've, I've put that forward many times uh, over the years, just to remind everybody, <laughs> if, if you're in a pinch, uh, you know, I got, I got this. Uh, but again, look, Kenobi sat on the shelf, my shelf for six years before it you know, became a novel. Uh, it, so, uh, you know, stories will keep. Uh, and likewise with, uh, with Rios here, um, I got to the end of it and realized, oh yeah, there's there's directions you can go. Um, you know, we do still have the issue of it winds up in the same place, uh, which is it winds up in 2399. Um, but uh, but you know, time wise, there's plenty of time. Um, and and yeah, the 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 notion of doing, you know, the Brian Daly you know, Han Solo trilogy, except with uh, except with with except with Rios, that feels kind of fun. Um, but I keep thinking of Han Solo. I yeah, well, even even on the show, I would think about Han. Yeah, Solo. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. The first thing I read in in you know first tie in novels I read after um, after Splinter of the Mind's Eye were the Han Solo books, and the Han Solo books kind of, of course, I had already read comics that were you know original of the Star Wars universe, uh, and even you know some Star Trek ones. Uh, you know, it was it was it was um, it was really the the daily books that were kind of like. All right, these are kind of open ended. This could have happened at any point in this vague period in between um, the two movies, uh, not two movies, but any time before Star Wars. Uh, and you know, uh, and we just know that it ends with him, you know, at uh, at Mos Eisley when Luke needs a ride. Uh, and uh, you know, it, there's there's something kind of um, of fun about that, uh, about uh, you know, you know, being able to go any direction you want to go. Um, although, uh, you know, I think, I think Daly was hamstrung a bit by not being able to use the empire, uh, much at all. He had the corporate sector instead. Uh, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, but that's not, that's no problem. I mean, I, I do the same thing. I avoid things where I'm going to collide with stuff. So, uh, you know, this is not a Starfleet book and fans of Starfleet, uh, particularly, you know, uh, uh, fans of sort of what I would consider to be the the um, the military cosplay 
element of Starfleet. You know, the the you know uh, we're we're all going to uh, you know count the pips on our collars, and we're we're going to have uh, meetings in the ready room and meetings, uh, you know, staff meetings where we'll discuss things. Uh, 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 this is not this is not for them. Um, this is this is this is somebody who is operating on the fringes of the universe, uh, or not the fringes of the universe, the fringes of the of the society, uh, and doing things that I think are consistent with commerce as it would be practiced um, in the fringes of society, where you know it's this is this is not a this is not a utopian realm that he's in. This is a place where. Yeah, even though replicators exist, not everybody's got one. I want to touch on something at the end of this book. We have Vash is mentioned because mm-hmm. Vash is actually Zand- Zandra Quimby, the yep. professor. Yep. And uh, we also have LaSalle talking about CG. So these are in the <laughs> epilogue here, kind of wrapping things up. Uh, those were a bit of a surprise to me. Yeah, um, you know these are well the the Lazelle thing, and I, I've mentioned before that 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 chapter was the last one that I wrote because I I always know how my epilogues are going to go. I, I always know how my my ending ending is going to go, uh, but I knew that Lazelle wasn't part of the epilogues, and I knew that um, you know I had to walk her off with um, something that explained why somebody as level-headed as she was uh you know would involve herself in in this cover-up uh and you know the obvious answer was staring me right in the face which is obviously she suspected her uncle of having blown up praxis uh because he had means motive and opportunity and um you know if that were true nothing that she or he could do in a thousand years I think the line is uh, could erase that. Uh, that would have been that horrible. Um, so, so uh, you have that, uh, and and then you know with uh, with the Vash character, uh, who is of course uh, you know XQ is Q's X uh, is the joke. Um, again, I wanted to have multiple players chasing this thing. I wanted to have. Um, a situation where basically with the exception of the Miradorns, everybody that sets foot on his ship is involved in this chase. This it's a mad, 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 mad galaxy chase for this thing. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, they're not, but even they're not completely innocent because, you know, they, uh, they ran afoul of the Silva's project at one point. Uh, yeah, it, I, I wanted, I wanted, uh, you know, there to be this person that would always be in the shadows and, um, you know, once I had Vash, I had Sovak. Once I had Vash and Sovak, I had Sovak's brother and, uh, you know, there we go. Oh, great. Cause I was just going to mention, we haven't even talked about the Ferengi. So yeah, yeah, the, yeah, them, yeah. the two brothers and stuff. I liked Sovak when was driving around the ship in a car. I messaged you about that. I was just right on that chapter when we were like setting up this time. I mean, that was just like, even today I was watching the first, the episode where Rios makes his appearance on the ship. Yeah. And I kept picturing the car. Yeah. The <laughs> car, the cars, the car is uh, on the, uh, the, the, the alcove to the right, uh, which is on the port side, looking back. Uh, that's where the car is parked. It races, you know, bounces over the uh, over the uh, bounces over the cargo transporter, uh, and then makes a makes a makes a right into sort of this this whole back part here, uh, you know, the uh, the the uh, this you know, starboard uh, starboard aft. That is a a sizable cargo area that he's able to slam around, you know, it gets girders off of, it gets supports. Uh, and then and then race back and then of course uh you know make that leap off of uh off of the uh you know we, yeah this is we can't forget that this is a spaceship that has a hole in it i mean it's got a big you know open open drop down to the galley i was and, worried he would fall down in that and that's what happened well of course of course 
<laughs> of course. I mean, all the metal balls. Even yeah, like that, well, right? of course. No, I, and I'm like, how can I, how can I, you know, make a mess of this? And then, then, then Rios has to clean it up. Uh, <laughs> right. And, and, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a horrible, horrible mess. Uh, but again, uh, Fajo makes a horrible mistake letting him keep the car. Well, okay, we're we're almost getting into time, and there's a couple of things I do want to bring up. But we didn't talk about Marta, the admiral, and yeah. her relationship with Rios. Is that character the connection to Starfleet for him in this book? Yes, absolutely. Um, because uh, Rafi could not be. Uh, Rafi could not even be the connection to Picard because Rafi is on the outs with Picard uh, at this point, uh, as established in Last Best Hope, and then also in the TV series. Uh, we can't, we can't, we can't have her be the back channel to Picard, but she can be the back channel to Marta and Marta can be the back channel to Picard. So, so that, that sets it up. I wanted Picard to be in the book, by the way, that was, that was always a thing. Um, we could not have them meet. And I realized as I got a little further into the plot, I did not want him, you know, at the very beginning, I was like, yeah, I want to do something where books are important and maybe, you know, the five excerpts are all excerpts from an adventure of Picard's that are in Picard's book. And then as I got further into it, I said, well, you know, I really, really, really want to have this chapter at the beginning explaining how weird the Iotians are. And right. then I knew that I wanted to have a chapter about, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the actualities. And by that point, I'm like, okay, yeah, that's, that's how we're going to do this. We're also going to have Picard. We're also going to have uh, Dixon Hill, and uh, and uh, we're going to go from there. Uh, it also has this very kind of curious, you know, chapter, an excerpt from a book that has not been written yet. Uh, I didn't put a date on it, which is uh, the letters of Jean-Luc Picard, <laughs> which, which was the only way to get it done. Um, but, but yeah, uh, but yeah, the, Marta was going to be this person who is his connection to that life. She rips open all the stitches uh, and takes him down the spiral that is going to cause him to bottom out, is going to cause Ledger to walk away. When when Ledger walks away, that's when he's hit bottom um, because she was the only person who begrudgingly started to believe in him and um, you know started to... It, it's not that she was really believing in him, but she was thinking that his business might actually be worth something. Uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, because he certainly doesn't give her a lot of reasons to believe in him. Um, but, you know, when she's out, she's out. And when she's out, he knows, okay, I, I, I've, I've lost the last person who gave a damn at all. And, um, and, uh, and Marta does care, but Marta cares in a way that he can't be around. I'm glad you mentioned Rafi too, because we didn't really talk about her, but I like that she's just a character that's checking in on him and we're building that relationship and seeing that they've had this relationship for quite a while leading up to the series. That's right. And I made sure to bring her in at some times that were um, not consequential to the book. Uh, I, I brought her in some times where she's just rapping with him, have a conversation. And I had her even show up, you know, make, she even makes a call at a really inappropriate, inappropriate time or a bad time uh, so that she can drop the piece of news that she has somebody that is looking for him and he can completely ignore it because he's got so much else going on. Right. So the last thing, though, I want to bring up is your section headers. I saw you post this the other day on Facebook. You got yeah. the wordplay and the symbols, and I thought it'd be interesting to hear you talk about how you came up with those. Um, one of the things that I really need to stop doing uh, is I, <laughs> I, I spent a lot of time on my book titles and I also spent a lot of time on, um, you know, my, uh, my section starts and um, you know, sometimes it's, it's easy. Sometimes it's hard. And then finding the quotations, cause I usually drop a quotation or something in there. Uh, I, I, I usually put something like that in there and, Sometimes it's really simple where just everything starts with the same, um, you know, the same letter. Um, I think, I think in, in enterprise war, everything ends in ION or something like that. Uh, it, you know, not, it's not, it's not very aggressive. You know, the prey trilogy, um, you know, the, the, 
every every word in the first or every section title in the first book is a possessive construction uh, where the second word leads to the next. So uh, we go from um, Krug's blood to Spock's test and the word blood and test blood test. That's a word. Nice. Then the, then the next book or the next one is the same The next chapter. Also, it's a possessive construction followed by something that test connects to. And I can't remember what it is. Uh, test fire or something. But anyway, uh, yeah, I think it's test fire because it's Krug's fire by that is the next one. And, uh, and then Quark's target. Yeah. So it's, so it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, that one was uh, blood test fire target. Uh, and, and uh, the second book is the same way with the construction matching the construction of the title of the book, third book, same way again. Um, and again, that's something just minor. Nobody cares about unless I mention it. But here I was like, there's a puzzle here uh, in that's central to the book. And I didn't know whether to say section one or part one or phase one or whatever. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to open these sections uh, with uh, with you know, the title uh, and the title will relate to the particular element, rogue elements, the particular element in the Wu Ching, uh, yes. which which is the Chinese uh, seasons uh, or the Chinese the Chinese formulations of these things, uh, and and it will be in the order that he needs to put the puzzle in to solve it, and the reason that he can't just do this thing you know, on a computer and figure it out is because it's a manual thing that snaps back as soon as you put the wrong answer into it. And so, you know, he, it is really like a Rubik's cube that resets itself, uh, which has got to be really annoying. Uh, if you, if you get the wrong answer, uh, snap, snap, snap. Uh, and so, um, yeah, but the, the but the, uh, guys, it's funny. My, my colleague, David Mack on Facebook today, uh, just went through what all those symbols mean in various things. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, you know, I said, you know, uh, there ought to be a book for this. Uh, uh, but I bet you there's a book that explains it. Uh, I don't know if he's got this copy yet, but, but that is indeed, um, uh, what you have to know is you have to know what he learns from Vash, which is he has to think interculturally, the same way that uh, that uh, that Parch always says, uh, because Parch is mixing and matching Klingon and Romulan and and human and Vulcan all the time, and uh, and so this is a case where um, you you have the the, the Wu Ching seasons, but you have to go through uh, the Wu Ching planet symbols, uh, and then go into the planet symbol or and then go into the the uh the greek symbols uh, at that point so i'm mi- i'm mixing and matching things uh but but yeah uh and and then it feeds back into the 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 section titles of the book because uh you know the first season the first element uh in in book 1 or not book 1 in part 1 is water and uh and so what is the title? The Wretches of the Sea, which is also a double entendre, uh, because we have uh, we have uh, we have uh, you know Rios retching quite a bit <laughs> in, this, yes. in this. But but uh, but again, you know that's the sea. Then we have the forest, uh, and so that's wood. Uh, so we go from water to wood to fire, the traitor in the pl- the flames. Uh, the book just the book just happens to be opening right to these. Uh, and, uh, and, and it, and it goes forward, uh, you know, the earth in the window, it's literally an earth, literally in a window. (laughs) That's true. Yeah. (laughs) And, and, and of course, earth relates to, to earth. And of course, oddly, the, uh, oddly, the, uh, the Wu Ching, uh, 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 symbol for earth is, is not the same as, uh, as, as, uh, as the planetary symbol for earth. Uh, but yeah, then, uh, then, oh, what's the last one? 
uh, the chains of the coward angels. And the, and again, um, that was actually the first title I came up with. The chains would obviously be metal. Metal is the last uh, stop. Uh, and uh, that comes from uh, Dante's Inferno. That is the first people that you meet on your way uh, into hell uh, is the, the, the angels who stood by and let something bad happen. Dang. See, you put a lot of thought into this stuff. <laughs> well, but I mean, but again, how do I get there? I get there in part just by I'm a lot of the time. I'm just I'm trying to figure out, well, what's a cool title for this? What's a cool quotation? And then this leads me down this road. This leads me down that road. And, you know, how I get the things like sub-referencing Brewster's Millions. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's that's my own personal madness. So uh, that's 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 my own craziness. Well, I can tell you that I really enjoyed this book, and I honestly think this is a book that should be read a second time because all these little elements that elements there we go rogue uh-huh. elements that I'm picking up. I'd like to go back and read again and see more how that connects that I didn't pick up before. And you know, there's double entendres at the time, not entendres, but double double means the entire like, rogue. You know, we have our our your rogue, and we have there our elements. Uh, That's right. there yeah, it is. no, it's yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's all there. Um, no, I uh, I I'm really really happy with how it came out. I yeah, I do wish that we lived in a world where people who were not Star Trek fans would pick up a Star Wars book, or people who were not Star Wars fans would pick up a Star, or rather, people who are not Trek fans would pick up a Trek book. People who are not Star Wars fans pick up a Star Wars book. Um, you know, you don't ever really see, um, you know, these uh, the, you know, the tie-in books. One of the reasons that we started the International Association, I say we, I'm just a member, I'm not one of the founders, but one of the reasons that the International Association of Media Tie-in Writers was founded uh, was because, you know, traditional science fiction, uh, you know, reviewers and uh, you know, organizations, they, they, they tend to look at at licensed fiction as being you know sort of in its own category it's it's its own island it's pre-sold it doesn't need doesn't need anybody's help um and usually the readers of it don't go out and read other things uh it, it, that are not in that um not in that sub sub subset uh, of the genre and and again vice versa and unfortunately you know that has been proven to be true in a lot of cases um you know, one of the one of the problems that I've got writing stuff about video games uh, is, um, you know, I've I've done some you know writing for video game comics, video game uh, uh, video game short fiction, uh, you know, with uh, with uh, you know Halo and and Mass Effect. Uh, I remain unconvinced that the readers of that material read any other comics read any other um uh, uh you know fiction uh science fiction uh i'm certain that there are uh, i'm certain that there are uh exceptions um i'm certain that there are people out there and i'm certainly now that i've said this we're gonna have people come out and say oh yes i, I read this and that and the other thing yeah. but i i i i do my conventions and i have my twitter feed and i know my overlap uh and I know that I have a lot of Star Wars fans that are have have traveled over to my Star Trek books. Uh, it has taken years. Uh, I I you know I I even even did a post uh, a couple of days ago saying you know look you really don't have to know anything about Trek to be able to get into this because if you understand if you understand Canon Jarrus's situation uh, at the beginning of a new dawn, well here we are. It's 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 uh it's it's the same same situation. No, I'm glad you said that because even when I read this book and I know Picard, I thought, well, even Star Trek fans who haven't watched Star Trek Picard for whatever reason would not get lost in this. No, book there's it, the, the, it, it stands on its own. There's absolutely you know if if you don't have if you don't have Paramount Plus if you've never watched one of the new shows at all this doesn't this this stands this stands alone it almost stands alone. Uh, in terms of being a a, a a a Star Trek novel versus a novel novel, in that Star Trek's in it, uh, but this is not, you know, I mean, they're the 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 major major major, um, you know, callbacks, uh, you know, from this are an episode of the original series that 
everybody in the world has seen. Uh, just about. Uh, but even if they didn't, they would understand yeah, what's and, going on. And 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 the villain from uh, you know one of the the best uh, selling movies that they did. Um, and, you know, is you know Chang Khan. You know, you're you're that's that's your two big villains from the the first six movies. I mean, it's uh, uh, you know, the whales don't really have a name. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, that's, uh, absolutely that's, uh, and so, so yeah, my, my wish and my hope is that, um, you know, we'll reach out beyond to a degree. And, you know, one of the things that I am liking is that the audiobooks do very, very well. Uh, and, uh, that we do have, I do believe that there is, uh, probably more traffic in the science fiction listening audience uh than there is in the science fiction reading audience uh just because there's not as much material that's interesting because you know they weren't doing audiobooks for the longest time they were then they stopped for a while so it's good to hear well, they weren't doing hard covers like either and i'm glad we uh well we are i mean it's exactly yeah, yeah i like I, seeing them at the front of the store you know? uh yeah it's uh yeah it's delightful i have uh, i have now signed every copy in a in a uh a 60 mile radius for me so <laughs> <laughs> that's great <laughs> well what else are you working on i hope there's something else you're working uh, on. a lot of stuff is coming out uh i mean we have uh, uh you know, the big uh the big thing for uh star wars that came out is a literal big thing that was the knights of the old republic or actually the star wars the old republic uh a giant uh compendium the omnibus which has all of uh of my knights of the old republic comics in it 1344 uh pages i wrote every one uh, well, I probably didn't write the table of contents, but I'm, I'm, I am, I, I, I wrote everything in the table of contents, uh, and it is the best possible, um, you know, printing of this I can imagine. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's, uh, it's oversized. Yeah, you know, all, all I could see doing is, you know, if they did an even bigger book with my notes in it, I think you wouldn't be able to lift it because it's seven and a half pounds as it is. Uh, and uh, that came out in July, and I am delighted that that was, um, according to Diamond, it was the best-selling uh, graphic novel in the whole comics industry last month, um, yes. uh, in the month of July. Not just in dollars, but in units, and that is mind-blowing, because that means, by my math, and I run a website called Comicron, so I do the math uh, on sales charts, yeah, I've told people check my work, but I think this might be the best-selling omnibus um, in launch uh, for Marvel uh, ever, nice. uh, and that that tells you that people like the old stuff just as much as the new stuff. Or there's there's a hunger for seeing it in one place. Uh, also, that came out uh, Epic Collection Volume Four. That's my Lost Tribe of the Sith comics because you had mentioned the 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 book uh, that is reprinted for the first time in seven years in that. Uh, reprinted also by uh, Titan. Uh, they did one volume already in June, and the next volume is coming out in September. Uh, these are collected editions of the fiction that was in Star Wars Insider Magazine. And I had a story in both of those. Um, my prequel to the Kenobi novel uh, is the lead story in, uh, in that hardcover that comes out in September. That's volume two. Uh, and, uh, and so, yeah, this is a lot of, a lot of reprint stuff. Uh, I am working on something that I cannot discuss. Uh, so, you know, there we are. So, yeah, that's uh, I have to wait. <laughs> Sorry. You haven't written anything new in star Wars in a while though. Right? No, I had a story in, uh, the empire strikes back, uh, from a certain point of view. Uh, that, that came out in November and that was a Ray Sloan story that tied in with, uh, new dawn, uh, and actually not tied in, but she's from race Ray Sloan from the new dawn that ties in with, uh, with the empire strikes back and has some callbacks to, uh, Knights of the old Republic, the comics I did uh, there. So, you know, I'm finding this whole, you know, you know, band between the legends banner and the new stuff kind of malleable. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's not that you can automatically wave a hand and bring somebody in from the past but uh you know nods and and winks uh that, that we do we do, do a good bit of that and i expect that will continue to be the case whatever happens with coda yes good answer for both <laughs> yes i was going to say something about coda but you know i don't want to put anybody on the spot here so we'll wait we'll see we'll see we will see yes 
We will see. Well, where can people find you online? Uh, my website, farawaypress.com. Uh, Got notes and behind the scenes on everything. Uh, I will eventually have a, a thing on there where people can order signed copies uh, I, of things. I, I There's the pages on the site. I just have to actually get the link on the front page. Uh, JJM Faraway is my Twitter. Uh, John Jackson Miller uh, is uh, what I'm under on Facebook and Instagram. Nice. Well, just for our listeners know, I'm on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex. That's Admiral with the underline Rex. And uh, hey, you know, we've got a Facebook discussion group. John, I think you're in there. I'm pretty sure. I'm, are, but... I'm in many, many, many groups, whether I want to be or not. <laughs> I have no idea how I join them, but that's okay. But it's a great place to talk about Star Trek. We've got great listeners here on the show. I like to thank our patrons for supporting us. And John, thank you again for joining us. And Again, love the book. Everybody I know that's read the book has loved it. So you've I appreciate you've gotten it. really well. And and so. if you don't like the book, please don't tag me. That's all I ever ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, like we always tell our listeners, and that is to stay positive. So yeah. I want you to stay positive, whether you have good, bad reviews or whatever. No, I just it's my 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 policy is I don't read reviews uh, uh, myself if I can help it, uh, unless unless it's telegraphed that okay, this is going to be safe for your sanity. Uh, <laughs> Because I, I it, you know, it's 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 challenging enough to write anyway without actually having to hear the audience. Well, thanks again. We'll bring you back for your next Star Trek novel, even though you know I don't know if you're going to have one, but I'm assuming there's going to be one in the future. Uh, we'll see what happens. All right. Well, like I said, everyone, stay positive. <laughs>